This poem is Wealth after Lucille Clifton. Wealth, don't talk to me about wealth. When I got into Harvard, my guys joked it was to mow the lawns. I laughed until I met my roommates and they offered me a broom. If I accepted the broom and beat the cobwebs out of their heads, do you think I'd forget? Now I make poems in languages they can't register. You feel me? In every poem, I hide garden shears, invitations to banquets, and they still don't spell my name right. Apologies. When they say Jose, the only people to turn their heads are me and the janitors, line cooks, wait staff. Yes, landscapers, Jose el Poeta y Jose the Gardener, each of us biting our tongues, trying to make beauty grow from soil covering bones, barely under the surface. Hi, welcome to Brown Girl Book Lover. Today we have Jose Olivares. <laughs> Um, and we're speaking about his collection, Promises of Gold. I'm going to give you a little information about Jose. Jose is the son of Mexican immigrants. His debut book of poem, Citizen Illegal, was a finalist for the Penn J Jean Stein Award and a winner of the 2018 Chicago Review of Books Poetry Prize. It was named a top book of 2018 by a Droid Journal, NPR, and a New York Public Library. In 2019, he was awarded a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Paris Review, and elsewhere. Promises of Gold is his second collection. Jose, welcome to Brown Girl Book Lover. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to uh, see you. And okay, so tell us about Promises of Gold. Yeah, absolutely. Promises of Gold is a book of poems. Um, I started writing the book because I wanted to write a book of love poems for all of my friends and homies. And um, then the pandemic happened and what I found is that the poems became textured with a lot of like grief and fear and longing. And to me, that's what makes the poem so real. It's like, what is realer than having to love amidst all of the different circumstances that we encounter in the world? So for me, that's what makes the book special. I love that you said you are writing the book for your homies. Um, and, you know, I think in our society, um, we don't think that men have these like very like beautiful, loving bonds. Right. But I see it all the time. I see how they bond and deeply love each other and they show it in they show it like in very like feminized ways or very masculine ways. Right. And tell us about like just breaking that on that. I guess that intruding toxic masculine culture or ideas to just write love poems for your homies yeah absolutely i mean i think you're right about it actually being something that men you know one either do have or two like truly need i you know i immediately thought about going to the barber shop and the type of tenderness that you see between men um now, a lot of times I think about it in sports too, right? Like you like high five someone or hug them. You know, sometimes you need like the pretense of like we're playing a manly game, you know, to to like feel like you have permission to touch another man. Um, for me, what I wanted to, to do the poem, it was like one articulating some of these wants and desires mm -hmm. and these these like true relationships that I have with people, right? Um but the other thing that kind of struck me is, you know, I visit high schools and colleges, so I see a lot of young men. And the poems that I've written previously that those young men gravitated towards the most were poems that articulated this particular desire for love. I think so many of the men that I encounter are either in the process of trying 
to become more loving and expressive individuals or they want to like take steps to move in that direction, right? Because I think the silence, the kind of machismo really hurts men and keeps us from living our full lives. Absolutely. You know, this week I was on eating Taco Bell with Mexicans. The day I introduced Erica to my brothers, I warned her, my brothers are extra Mexican. What does that mean? She asks. I repeat, extra Mexican. When we hang out, they talk to her in English and ask her how she can love someone as ugly as me. Do you have bad breath? Are your teeth fake? What's wrong with you? Why do you love our brother? They laugh in Spanish at their own jokes. They play Mario Kart and sing along to Bad Bunny. They say they're broke and blame capitalism. They say they're single and blame capitalism. They say they're in love and blame capitalism. They ask Erica if she's hungry and tell her she's in luck. Mm -hmm. Erica nods. She kisses me on the cheek in a language that needs no translation. She points at me and says he's the lucky one. My brothers laugh because she speaks their language of dumb jokes. They promise to take her to the bomb Mexican spot. The Mexican spot Mexicans try to keep a community secret. Then they take her to Taco Bell. Thank you. I really love this poem. And you know, the thing is that like it appears really casual and simple, but then when you dig deeper, you know, you start to understand like how it's connected to like bigger realities, right? They're talking about capitalism, like they're broke in capitalism, they're in love and cap blame capitalism. And I love just like how you take this personal reality and connect it to something larger. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, part of it is that that's the way my brothers are in real life, you know? Um, they're like, I don't, I don't know how this happened, but they ended up, you know, also finding their ways to like so societal critiques that are bigger than just the individual. And so, you know, they they really do love to blame capitalism for, you know, a variety of their their problems and, and maladies or whatever. So part of it is just the way that they are. I do think that in writing poems, that there is an intimate connection between the personal and the political, right? And uh, it shows up in, in different ways in each of the poems. So I think in, in this poem, it definitely comes from my brothers and from their own kind of, you know, subversiveness in, in how they they try to be in the world. Mm -hmm. Tell us about um, this book, because there's an English side and there's a Spanish side. And I love that. And like, you know, why did you do that? How did you come up with this idea and how is it received? Yeah, I mean, the idea comes from reading a, a Puerto Rican poet named Raquel Salas Rivera. Mm -hmm. um, he's a poet from Puerto Rico who's written a couple of different books that have featured kind of English and Spanish components. And his work was really, I would say his work, and there's another poet, uh, Ariel Francisco, um, who's a Dominican and Guatemalan poet. They're really the first people I saw that pretty regularly include both Spanish and English translations of their work. Um, that was really special to me because growing up when I was a student, you know, in all English classrooms, I could never share with my parents the work that I was learning or ask them for help or, you know, little things like that. And so when I began the process of finding a publisher for Promises of Gold, it was important to me to ask the publishers to support a bilingual edition because... You know, I wanted my parents to be able to read it. My parents have read this book. Uh, they really enjoyed it. Although, you know, my mom said it made her cry, which is understandable. Um, so I wanted my parents to be able to read this book, but I also thought about 
who I was when I was a young person and what it would mean to have a book that I'd be able to share with my parents and have them, you know, have that experience of of working through something together as a family. Um, and so that's why the edition exists the way it does. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm been super happy to see that like some people and families have been like book clubbing it together. To me, that's really sweet and special. Oh, that's awesome. I really like that. Can you read a poem in Spanish? Your choice. My choice? Yeah. Okay. Tradición. Las historias dicen que los mexicanos surgieron de la tierra igual que los tallos del maíz. Por supuesto, no éramos mexicanos todavía. Aquello que éramos estaba perdido. No, no perdido. Sumergido bajo el imperio. Tenido por la sangre y la polvora. Cree lo que quieras. Tal vez sí surgimos de la tierra. Tal vez el agave es nuestro hermano. Tal vez las montañas nuestra madre. La tradición más vieja que conozco es ver a mi papá apostarle dinero a boxeadores mexicanos, sin importarle las, probabil sin importarle las probabilidades. Yo no sé ustedes, pero yo soy hijo de la pérdida y heredero de las pérdidas. Aunque no me estoy quejando, conozco la tradición. Le apuesto todo lo que tengo a mi gente y reto al universo a que nos venza. I love this line. Uh, I am the child of loss and the inheritor of losing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I love people who are just proud of their culture and the essence of it, you know, and I, I really love this and, and the dare of the universe to beat us. Tell us about it because this is the first poem. This is framing everything. Tell us about this poem. Yeah. I wanted to try. When I started writing it, I was trying to frame, you know, where, where my family comes from and, and, you know, what part of Mexico they come from. And I was trying, and as I was trying to think of it, like one, when I attempt to trace, you know, my my family's history, there's a certain point where the paperwork stops because my family was mostly, was all like poor farmers in like mountain towns, not in big cities, right? And so in, in rural areas, there's just not as much documentation. Um, and so I was thinking about how even though I can't trace my family, I'm sure that if I trace my family, what would happen is, you know, one generation would be, you know, citizens of like New Spain, and then the next generation would be citizen of Mexico. And as the kind of country changed, their living situation would probably not change all that much. And so there's this sense of like, who we are is something deeper than just like an ethnic or a national identity, right? It, it returns back to, you know, all my family for years until this generation have been born in this particular part of Mexico. And so um, I was trying to think about how, I, I was just trying to consider all of those things when I wrote it. And I started to think about all of the kind of folk tales that we tell, uh, that Mexicans tell about where we come from and coming from the corn and like the land being so important. And so it was a way to ground this book, which goes so many places and is so especially shaped by like the particularities of Chicago to ground it in this land where my, my family has been born for generations. And to think about that tradition and how even as, you know, maybe we keep losing in particular ways. Like we, I just think about my family and, and there's always been that like bet on ourselves type of attitude and that kind of 
I don't know what to call it, a willingness, a determination to succeed, to continue to like grow the next generation and to really believe that, you know, no matter what is against us, we will always come out on top. Yeah. I think that's a, that philosophy is really beautiful, right? Because you, you, you not only believe in yourself, but you believe in the generation to come after you. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's really empowering. And it's, it's, I think it's it's visionary in a way because you're like, we will win. I can't see it now, but we will win. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think to me, that's really, that comes from somewhere, you know what I mean? It doesn't start with me or my parents, but it's, it must have been the, t the determination of ancestors to, mm -hmm. to really believe that no matter the odds that, that we would, that we will win and that we will continue to win. And, you know, um, so yeah, that there is something that feels kind of visionary to me. And even talking to you now, I don't know exactly where the poem comes from. You know, there's some, to me, there's some sort of magic that, you know, even I cannot necessarily touch about these poems. And, and, you know, I think this is the beauty of like poems, like good poems and poet. Uh, I think they're willing to connect to that magic. Last two questions. What are two takeaways you want readers to receive from Promises of Gold? Two takeaways. One takeaway is um, that poetry does not have to be an intimidating experience, right? That poetry is for everybody. Um, and so my hope is that even people that are normally allergic to poetry will enjoy this book and will be open to the experiences within. And then another takeaway that I want people to have is um, I want people to like call their friends more. And like, you know, I really believe that friendships are really special and that we should take care of them the way we take care of any of our other relationships. Thank you for saying that because I've been, I've been saying that for a long time. And yeah. you know, I, you know, my friend, my really good friend, she told me something I'll never forget. She said, friendships are our greatest love story. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this is like, you know, I, I love when she said that to me and like when I'm reading your book and I'm seeing just like, just the love between friends, it just reminds me of that. And that is important. You know, our friends are, there are our lovers as well, you know, and yeah. we should keep them close. Absolutely. Well, Jose. Thank you for joining me on Brown Girl Book Lover to talk about your book. I really enjoy these conversations. I love talking to poets. They're just, I think you guys are magical beings. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'll take it. Thank you so much for talking to me. It was a lovely conversation. Same here. Take care. <laughs>